charges unsealed today describe cheating, coming, and going. Specifically, insider trading first on the long side and then on the short side, on a scale that has really no historical precedent. As the criminal complaint in this case alleges, by cultivating and corrupting a doctor with access to secret drug data, former portfolio manager Matthew Martoma and his hedge fund benefited from what might be the most lucrative inside tip of all time. In any case, this is certainly the most lucrative insider trading scheme ever charged, allegedly resulting in an illegal windfall to the hedge fund of more than a quarter of a billion dollars, and that's billion with a B. As I will describe more fully in a moment, at the heart of this scheme was confidential information about an experimental drug treatment for Alzheimer's disease being developed jointly by the pharmaceutical companies Elan Corporation and Wyeth. As Mortoma allegedly got his sneak peeks at drug data from the doctor, he first recommended that the hedge fund build up a massive position in Elan and Wyeth stock. At one point, by the end of June of 2008, that stake totaled more than $700 million. Then, as also alleged, after the doctor secretly slipped Mortoma the unexpectedly bad results of a clinical drug trial, the defendant realized that the massive stake had become a colossal liability. And in a matter of just days, he caused the hedge fund not only to dump its shares, but also to short the two drug stocks in advance of the negative drug trial becoming public. As a result, of the blatant corruption of both the drug research and securities markets alleged. The hedge fund made profits and avoided losses of a staggering $276 million, and Martoma himself walked away with a $9 million bonus for his efforts. So from the $700 million long position to the more than $250 million short position, that was a swing in this case of nearly a billion dollars. And once again, Ordinary investors were cheated, the market was corrupted, and the rule of law took a backseat to illegal profit. Before I review some of these charges in more detail, let me introduce the other speakers here today and some of the folks who got us to this point. I am joined by Robert Kuzami, the Director of Enforcement of the Securities and Exchange Commission, and April Brooks, Special Agent in Charge of the FBI's Criminal Division here in New York. Uh, Mary Galligan, who is the Acting Assistant Director in Charge of the New York Division of the FBI, could not be with us today. But I also want to thank a number of other folks who helped to unwind this, uh, this significant and complex case. They are, from the SEC, George Canellis, Deputy Director of the Enforcement Division, Sanjay Wadwa, Associate Director of the New York Regional Office and Deputy Chief of the Enforcement Division's Market Abuse Unit, Amelia Cottrell, Assistant Director of the New York Regional Office, and Staff Attorneys Charles Riley and Matthew Watkins, and also Neil Handelman, who is a staff accountant with the SEC. Also here from the FBI are Doug Leff, Assistant Special uh, Agent in Charge, Paul Takla, Acting Supervisory Special Agent, and Richard Jacobs, uh, Coordinating Supervisory Special Agent. Um, and I also want to extend a special acknowledgement to Matthew Callahan, the lead agent on this case, who was actually with the defendant in Florida uh, as he was uh, presented there this morning and released on bail. He'll be appearing uh, in court, in magistrate's court here on Monday at 10 a.m. I want to thank him for his outstanding work. And then finally, I want to thank the outstanding, dedicated, and career prosecutors from my office who have been working on this case. They are Arlo Devlin Brown, the AUSA in charge of the prosecution, and Mark Berger and Anjan Sani, who head up our Securities and Commodities Task Force. Um, and all these people did really amazing work in getting us to this point. And I can't say enough thanks to the SEC and the FBI. So let me just take a couple of minutes to talk about some of the particulars of the case I began to describe a moment ago. So in the summer of 2008, scientists and investors alike were awaiting the results of a clinical trial being conducted by Elon and Wyeth of a drug known as BAPI, which offered a novel but untested approach to the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. As I mentioned, as, as the complaint describes, uh, at the center of the scheme was the cultivation of a renowned medical doctor and Alzheimer's expert. That doctor is now a cooperating witness with the government and he is prepared to testify in connection with a non-prosecution agreement with our office. Martoma 
got access to data about the experimental drug by corrupting this doctor, who was not just a renowned doctor, but a doctor who was a paid consultant to Elon, who was personally involved in the drug trials in question, and who was later selected to actually announce himself the drug trial results at the Alzheimer's Disease Conference on behalf of those two pharmaceutical companies. Beginning in the summer of 2006, as the drug trial was just getting underway, Martoma began arranging paid consultations with the doctor through an expert networking firm. During those consultations, and there were approximately 42 consultations, Martoma eventually got the doctor to start talking about his work on the drug trial. In connection with the doctor's encouraging inside information about the drug, the complaint alleges the following, among other things. The hedge fund built up over time a massive position in Elon and Wyeth stock. The hedge fund built up this position even though it was vocally opposed by several others at the hedge fund who were worried about the risk of that investment. In fact, as the complaint describes, Martoma was the only person at the hedge fund who was recommending establishing such a large position in Elon and Wyeth based on that drug. Following Martoma's adamant recommendation, by the end of June 2008, as I mentioned, the hedge fund owned more than $700 million in Elon and Wyeth stock. As further alleged, in July of 2008, however, Martoma got good news and bad news. The good news was his source, the doctor, was selected to present the full results of the drug trials at an upcoming Alzheimer's conference and would receive those results before almost anyone else in the world. The bad news was that the results, with respect to the drug, were negative. The data, in fact, raised serious questions about how well the drug worked, or if it even worked at all. As alleged in the complaint, the doctor provided the secret, not yet public results directly to Martoma on July 17, 2008, even going so far as to send Martoma a draft of the 24-page PowerPoint presentation the doctor planned to present at the conference later. And that is when Martoma, according to the complaint, had to do a spectacular about-face because he understood that with these negative results looming, the hedge fund's massive $700 million stake had become a terrible bet. And so, just like that, overnight, Martoma went from bull to bear as he tried to dig his hedge fund out of a massive hole. Over a 12-day period, described in the complaint at Martoma's urging, the hedge fund sold quickly and quietly almost all of the approximately 17.5 million shares it owned of Elon and Wyeth. What's more, to capitalize even more on the still secret bad news, the hedge fund also took up short positions on Elon and Wyeth. To give you just some sense of how much trading we're talking about here, records suggest that over a one-week period in July 2008, the hedge fund's trading in Elon stock alone represented more than 20% of the entire reported trading volume in that security. By the time of the public announcement of adverse results of the drug trial on July 29th, the hedge fund was sitting pretty with the unwinding complete and its new trading position in place. The next day, after the results had become public, the stock price of Elan plummeted over 40%, and the stock price of Wyeth fell some 12%. If you take a look at this, One, just one final point of epilogue uh, in the case as described in the complaint, and it's this. Uh, Martoma had, as described in the complaint, as I've been mentioning here, had a banner year in 2008 and was rewarded handsomely, as I already mentioned. The following year, uh, however, Martoma, his portfolio, lost money, and the hedge fund employee recommended that he be terminated, stating in an email that Martoma appeared to be a, quote, one-trick pony with Elon, close quote. And so in 2010, Martoma was, in fact, terminated from the hedge fund. So 
Those of you who have been following the cases that all of us have been bringing over the, the last three years know that this is the 73rd defendant to be charged with insider trading by our office criminally in the past three years. He's also the third person to be charged in the past two years with insider trading around secret drug trial results leaked by doctors who both worked on the clinical trials and also served as paid experts on the side for hedge funds. The charges today should remind everyone who would be cheaters if they needed reminding that while the temporary payoff on an insider deal can be huge, they can find themselves with nowhere to spend their illegal profits but the prison commissary. The magnitude of the alleged scheme uh, is so large that, it, that it, it sort of boggles the mind. But one thing to bear in mind in this case and in all the cases we bring is that on the other side of the hundreds of billions of dollars in the hedge funds trades were ordinary investors, investors who did not know the confidential results of the drug trial in advance. They didn't have the secret sauce. And they unwittingly suffered the large losses that Martoma, through his alleged corruption of the doctor in this case, had avoided for the hedge fund. And that is and continues to be unacceptable to the people standing up here and to the agencies that we represent. And that is why we will continue to prosecute cheaters who make the stock market less fair for everyone else. And, and with that, I want to call to the podium uh, my friend and colleague, Robert Kazami of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Thank you, Pree. Today, once again, I find myself here alongside our criminal law enforcement partners announcing new charges of insider trading by yet another prominent hedge fund firm and its portfolio manager. You've heard the United States Attorney lay out the disturbing facts of this case. But I want to take a moment and speak not to today's insider traders, but to tomorrow's. Those persons, Wall Street professionals, or increasingly not, who will wake up tomorrow morning tempted by the mirage of success and false profits. And when they read the headlines about today's case that all of you will write, my message to them is, let that be a moment of conscience and calculation. It can be a moment of conscience when they read the headlines and recall the most basic advice that they learned as children, the same advice that they likely teach their own children, do right and not wrong and play by the rules choose that moment to re-embrace the principles of integrity and fairness that once guided their lives, but which have been replaced by greed and the illusion and delusion of achievement that comes with insider trading. But none of us up here today rely on conscious alone to deter those who are considering criminal acts. We're a bit more realistic. And that is why tomorrow morning, when those same would-be insider traders read the headlines, it should also be a moment of calculation. A moment to calculate exactly what they are up against should they choose to cross the line and break the law by trading on material non-public information. That calculation should include the cold hard fact that the SEC and our law enforcement partners are here to stay. Since October 2009, the SEC has filed more than 170 insider trading actions in most of the agency's history in any those actions, we have charged more than 410 individuals and entities, and those defendants are alleged to have made more than $600 million in illegal gains, and with today's case, nearly $900 million. And we continue to work closely on all those cases with our law enforcement partners. But the calculation by would-be insider traders must include the realization that while they may be subject to a wiretap if they choose to violate the law, as you see from today's case, all of us continue to make cases fashion way. We painstakingly review the hundreds of thousands of documents and emails and instant messages, pouring over phone records and match up calls with parties and scour voluminous trading records to see if there are profitable trades that were placed close in time to those calls. So banking on the odds that your phone is intact is a loser's game and won't protect you from law enforcement's long reach. The would-be insider traders should also calculate we have all been remarkably successful in convincing persons to cooperate with the government and provide evidence to us and in a court of law. So the calculation by tomorrow's insider traders must include the very real fact that you cannot trust your partners in crime to keep your secrets. And the calculation
calculations must further acknowledge that efforts to conceal insider trading have often failed. So it doesn't matter if you get your information through consultations arranged by expert network firms, as in today's action. It doesn't matter if you're not a Wall Street professional, as the involvement of today's medical doctor reveals. It doesn't matter if you introduce a middleman to obfuscate the tipping chain by eliminating links between the tipper and the trader. It doesn't matter if you speak in code stuff your file full of research and pretend that you bought the stock based on that. And it doesn't matter if you forego phone calls and emails and try to meet face to face because we've used metro card swipe records and restaurant reservations to prove associations between tippers and tippies. So if you're making those calculations and you think you can outsmart us, recognize that many others have thought the same thing and they were wrong and suffered career and life altering consequences as a result. So in the end, my message to tomorrow's insider traders is that it's a dangerous world for those who trade on inside information, and it's getting more dangerous. So whether for reasons of conscience or calculation, the best bet is not to do it at all. In closing, I'd like to thank U.S. Attorney Preet Bharara and April Brooks and their teams at the U.S. Attorney's Office and the FBI whose remarkable pattern and history of success in these cases quite remarkable. And I really want to recognize the hard work and dedication of the SEC staff who conducted this investigation with thoroughness and unflagging enthusiasm. Think of putting together a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle, and that's what reflects their effort. And that includes Sanjay Wadwa, who's behind me, who serves as Deputy Chief of the Market Abuse Unit and Associate Regional Director of the New York Regional Office. And to my right and your left, Amelia Cottrell, Charles Riley. Matt Watkins and Neil Henderson. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rod. Now let me call to the podium April Brooks, who is the special agent in charge of the FBI's Criminal Division here in New York. Good afternoon. Earlier today, FBI agents arrested, arrested Matthew Martoma in Florida on insider trading charge, which has been discussed previously. Today's arrest is the latest in the FBI's five year campaign to root out insider trading at hedge funds and expert network, networking firms. To date, these investigations have resulted in charges against more than 70 individuals. The investigation that brought today's charges is not the first, and surely will not be the last, to benefit from our own form of insider information. As the criminal complaint reveals, much of the evidence against Mr. Martoma was provided to us by a co-conspirator who is now a cooperating witness. The initiative undertaken by our office in 2007 in coordination with the U.S. Attorney's Office and the SEC has yielded other cases with similar profiles. In this instance, what we see is an unholy alliance between an insider willing to divulge valuable, non-public information and a money manager to whom that information is as good as gold. The cooperating witness was a doctor, an Alzheimer's expert, and a consultant to a company developing an Alzheimer's drug. He had unique access to information about the safety and efficacy of the drug. Martoma was a portfolio manager specializing in healthcare stocks. Martoma and the owner of the hedge fund that employed him traded heavily and aggressively on the expert's information. Based on insider information in advance of a favorable announcement, Martoma and the hedge fund owner bought large volumes of stock in the two companies developing the Alzheimer's drug Elon and Wyatt. By the end of 2008, the fund owned nearly three quarters of a billion in Elon and Wyatt stocks. Details of clinical tests of the drug were to be made public at a conference at the end of July. The insider, chosen by Elon to present the data at the conference, was provided an advance look of that data in mid-July. The clinical trial results were negative. Almost as soon as the insider learned this, surreptitiously passed it to Martoma, and Martoma and the hedge fund owner wasted no time in aggressively dumping Elon and Wyatt stock from the fund, as we've heard today. Between July 21st and July 28th of 2008, the fund sold all of its 10.5 million shares of Elon and all 7 million of its shares of Wyatt. But the fund didn't merely avoid losses. It greedily schemed to profit further by shorting Elon stock, an additional $4.5 and $3.25 million, respectively. 
the dumping of the now toxic stock, an abrupt about, about face from the acquisitive hoarding that preceded it, was a flood tide that accounted for more than one fifth of that week's total trading in Wyatt and Elon. The recurrent theme through all of the contact between the insider and Martoma was their knowledge that what they were doing was wrong. Prohibited by their respective employers, policies, and illegal practices. They engaged in continual subterfuge to disguise or conceal their communications. They emailed to schedule a phone call to discuss MS when they both, both knew the call would be about the Alzheimer's drug testing. They emailed to set up a call to discuss Parkinson's, also to disguise the purpose of another call about the clinical trials. On July 17, 2008, to prepare him for the conference, Elon sent the insider a document marked confidential, do not distribute. It contained a summary of the negative clinical trial results. The insider emailed the document to Martona later that very day with the password needed to access it. The insider and his information brought Martona nearly $10 million in compensation for 2008. But as another employee noted in recommending his firing for poor results, we've heard today he was described as one tricky pony. Paying a fee to consult industry experts and trading on their knowledge are permissible, so long as the knowledge isn't material, non-public information. A competitive advantage gained through superior research and analysis is one thing. Cheating is another matter altogether. A level playing field doesn't mean every player wins. It does mean, however, every player has equal access to information. To extend the metaphor, every player plays by the same set of rules. If the information isn't public, you can't trade on it. We will continue to bring these types of cases so long as people fail to act accordingly. I want to thank Preet and the Assistant United States Attorney Arlo Devlin Brown. Thanks also to Rob Kazami and the SEC. Lastly, I want to commend FBI case agents Matthew Callahan and his supervisor, Paul Tom. Thank you. Uh, thank you, April. Uh, happy to take questions about this case. Yes. Yeah, I'm not going to go into the details of what uh, that agreement is because it's not yet public. Uh, in every case, we consider facts based on the particulars of the case and the particulars of a particular witness uh, or potential defendant. Um, it's not a decision we make lightly to enter into a non-prosecution agreement with with someone, uh, but we made that decision in this case, and at some future date, there may be more information about that. Uh, the only thing I will tell you is, as outlined in the complaint, uh, the money that he got in connection with the consulting that he did to the tune of 42 some odd consultations with the defendant in this case. Uh, during the course of those consultations, he made approximately, I think, $100,000 uh, as a consultant. So that's the, that's, that's the figure that's recited there. And there. There's no recitation of any figure in the complaint, in our complaint at least, with respect to any trading gains that he might have had. There's no allegation of any trading gains on the, on the part of the doctor.
case to other cases other than the, the one explicit comparison I made in my opening remarks, and that is to point out that this is the second such case that involved uh, the corruption of a doctor in connection with, with, with drug crimes. They're dependent, second, second case. take time to put together. Criminal cases in particular take time to put together. They required the review of documents, as was pointed out earlier. Um, there, was, there was no reliance on, uh, in, in any of our complaints on, on wiretaps. Uh, sometimes it becomes difficult to see who is responsible for which degree of trading. Uh, sometimes it's necessary to have a cooperating witness in order to bring a certain kind of charge. So I'm, I'm speaking generally here. Uh, but you should know, based on our track record, track record of the FBI and the SEC that we work as hard and as fast as we can to bring cases that we can prove in court. Okay. I'm not going to get into reasons why we charge one way versus another. There, there are a lot of considerations in connection with that, and the passage of time is not necessarily one of them. Rob addressed that at, more, at greater length, but it, you know, a lot of it was due to the excellent work by folks at the SEC who began investigating because uh, they were reports of suspicious trading activity. I'm going to ask Sanjay Wadwa to answer that question. Who was the brains behind this operation? Well, I think it, it was at least in part uh, from other investigations that uh, we've been focusing on uh, CR Intrinsic, but also uh, based in part on a referral from FINRA, the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. There's, there's surveillance that's done on a regular basis by the exchanges and self-regulatory organizations and others that will um, typically uh, kick out on an exception report basis aberrational trading as compared to what you would otherwise expect to see. And then further analysis is done to determine whether or not there's a plausible explanation. 